And that's just an example of how far things have gone in the craze over refugee resettlement. And that brings us up to our next guest. Joining us now is Hilbert Nelson. He is the leader of a group called We the People Magic Valley, based in Twin Falls, Idaho. Hilbert, how are you doing today? Hi, Lee. Good to join you. Yeah, great to have you uh, on the on the show. Hilbert is one of the uh, great people I met up in Twin Falls when I was covering the story before. And uh, Hilbert's got a very interesting background. What, just tell people a little about yourself, what you do for a living, and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm a mental health therapist. I work with adults and couples uh, full time, and I've been doing that for a number of years. I have a licensed clinical social worker degree. And I enjoy that an awful lot. And I have a uh, family here, been here since 1992 with my wife and uh, three grandkids and our son and his wife. And Twin Falls has been our home for a long time. We came from Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, I'm, I originally was in advertising at that time, made the switch over. So we've enjoyed that uh, living here in Twin Falls a lot. And uh, uh, it's our home. So, yeah. Well, you sure? Just from that bio, you sound like a racist hater, Hilbert. Just from that, I, I think know people it. can hear. I, I think people uh, can hear the hate pouring out of you. <laughs> can you? So, can you hear the hate coming out of us? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, th- so this is, of course, I'm mocking what's been going on because you guys, we're going to get into the story here for people who may not be familiar with what's been going up in Twin Falls. But uh, one of the most interesting aspects to me is how the people who've been concerned about the issue up there have been smeared as racist haters and not just smeared by the local paper, the times news or the local TV stations, which has happened. Correct. And not just by the town council, you guys have been smeared by all of those, right? I mean, that's, that's accurate, but more recently you've also been smeared by the Washington post and the New York times and, Mm. and, all these other publications. So let's talk about it. What's, what's going on in Twin Falls? What's, what's the situation with the refugees, and why has it become controversial? Yeah, okay. If you, uh, for your listeners who want to get a little bit of context about all the things that have led up to now, go to our website, uh, We the People MV, and MV stands for magicvalley.com, and we created a website uh, collecting all the articles uh, of all the events since the rape by the three migrant boys in June, and then collected all that information right up until uh, November when uh, Chico Harlan from the Washington Post came to one of our We the People Magic Valley meetings and did his hit piece. Um, and we also on there you'll find the rebuttal by Vicki Davis, a researcher who made a presentation on globalism uh, to our meeting. And so you can get a real flavor of what's happened. You can see all of the articles from that right-wing uh, Muslim-hating uh, website called Breitbart.com, especially that That's right. reporter, Lee Stranahan. It's just awful hit pieces there, all of it fake news, of course. <laughs> so it's all in there. Uh, things have kind of died down here a bit in, in November. We had an awful lot of uh, momentum and um, um, fervor, you might want to call firestorm fervor, during the month of August. Not only did Breitbart and many others bring this story, which was being poo-pooed and called um, untrue by uh, Grant Loeb's, the prosecuting attorney regarding uh, Jayla's rape, which was uh, and also being being urinated on, um, and that story was uh, dismissed as untrue and probably racist based. And Breitbart and also We the People, Magic Valley, uh, City Council watchdogs brought that story to uh, to light and forced that story to become national and did a wonderful job with that. And that happened. Um, that that story broke while we were planning bringing Brigitte Gabriel from Act for America to Twin Falls in August. So things really kind of came to a big head during the month of August. Um, And and we had a lot of momentum in our groups. And so just to put it in context, a lot of people first heard about 
the uh, the assault that had happened in June, the one you, you talked about, where three refugee boys yeah. attacked this uh, mm-hmm. young girl and a mm-hmm. uh, five-year-old, and people heard about that, and there was some initial misreporting on some of the details. They said they were Syrian refugees. They weren't. They were from other countries. But that that's okay. what the media is focused on. It's a really irrelevant detail in the scheme of this. They were part of the ref- they were refugees. That's that's a fact. No one's disputed that. Uh, right. And they tried to make it out because there was one detail wrong in the initial reporting. Uh, and you, they tried you had to make the former mayor. And, yeah, you had the well, former mayor you, of you Twin Falls. The former mayor of, of Twin Falls, uh, Stephen Lanting, in his Facebook page, you know, did a rant about how it was all just you know, false accusations, and then later, of course, had to recant that. But yes, just to your point, that's exactly how that that initially started. So, uh, Brigitte Gabriel comes to Twin Falls, and we, the people, Magic Valley, by, by the way, put this in bigger context, is just a, a coalition of the John Birch Society and uh, Act for America and Amend to Idaho. And we all got together way back in April to uh, say how can we work together as a, a coordinated coalition of liberty-minded uh, or people in Twin Falls. Of course, we are racists and we're haters, if you want to hear what uh, the Washington Post has to say about us. But out of that came uh, a lot of momentum. Uh, since then, though, it's been pretty quiet here with the media. Um, the latest, of course, was the uh, Washington Post coming here, and you can see both that article and Vicki Davis's rebuttal on our website under local news. Now, now part of the controversy has been about the Chobani Yogurt Factory, which Chobani yeah. is a company owned by Hamdi Yulikaya. He's a Turkish businessman who's been in the United States, not a U.S. citizen as far as I can tell, which is just Right. Uh, I'm pointing that out. And he opened the world's right. largest yogurt factory in Chobani. And you mentioned Greg Lanting, who, who'd attacked, literally attacked the family when I was out there, attacked the family mm-hmm. on Facebook of the rape victim and told things that were not true about them. He later apologized after I reported it but and got a lot of national attention on, on what he'd done. But he was the guy, he said... He likes cutting ribbons, right? So they, so Twin Falls, which is a city of about fifty thousand people, right? It's about about that, a little under. I think. It's about about forty five, um, fifty thousand people and growing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So about fifty thousand people, and really a lovely community in a lot of ways, and uh, just um, right by the Snake River Canyon there, beautiful country, great people, and I I like to have you on as well because the way they try to paint, you know, if you read that Washington. Post article. Look, I know you know Vicky. You know Vicky's an educated woman. You're an educated person. This is not a, a a mob of racist yokels. I don't know how else to put it. But the people on the coast, that's the way they want to portray the people asking questions about the refugee program. And part of what's going on, and part of what I reported when I was up there, is that Hamdi Yulakaya, who is the CEO of Chobani. It's a privately held company. He's a major stakeholder. Has been a major advocate for refugees and has about a 30% refugee workforce. And Michael Patrick Leahy was on the other day, and we talked about this a little bit on the show. But, but Hamdi Okai has been a major advocate. And what, what I, when I looked into it, it was obvious to me that the town council of Sioux Falls, of the Twin Falls, forgive me, that the town council of Twin Falls did not want to cross Hamdi Yulikaya. They wanted to, uh, mm-hmm. I'll just say, suck up to him. I won't well, even say cross. They want to do anything. You know, there's video out there of Butch Otter, who's the Republican governor uh, of Idaho, literally hugging Hamdi Yulikaya. So this is Republicans and Democrats who stuck up for Yulikaya. And I think part of it is, they don't want to get the ire of a major business owner. And I actually had politicians, I won't name them, but I had politicians say to me that they question the refugee program up there, but they don't want to say anything 
about Yulikaya or Chobani at all. And and it's it's such a deal. It, just to paint the picture for people, if you go to Butch Otter's office or if you go to legislators' offices, they literally have Chobani yogurt in the fridge to give you while you're waiting, right? So this is that's that's right. that's not an exaggeration. Um, right next to Cliff so, Bar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. But Cliff is another company, and Cliff also right. hires refugees. So, what specifically, Hilbert? Let's drill down. What is your specific yeah. concern about refugees, about the refugee resettlement program, mm-hmm. as it's played out in Twin Falls? Yeah. Well, you touched on a couple of it, and if we take a bigger picture, and we think of the refugees as just a, with the refugees concern with not being vetted with uh, the violence problem that's associated with Sharia law that they do bring here to our country. Um, it's, it's this one. It's that it's part of a, uh, it's a symptomatic of a more of a globalization problem of rural America, which is transforming rural America. I think I mean, you and I had this discussion when you were here was if you look at Chobani and like you said, the sweetheart deals that, that he has got with, Twin Falls and Idaho and the governor and the legislature, that's one piece of the globalization puzzle. Then the other symbiotic unit is the CSI Refugee Center. For It's been here for 30 years, and there's never been a problem. When I came here in 92, never a problem. It's only recently as the United Nations policy has shifted and the types of populations that are coming here with the FBI public admitting we can't bet, we can't secure the nation. So you've got 9-11, you've got terrorist attacks, and you have refugees still coming in unbedded with tuberculosis and everything else. And then you've got the local oligarchy saying everything's fine. And with that old local oligarchy, you've got the, twin, the Times News that's very pro-refugee, You've got KMBT, which basically most of its reporting is soft news that makes a good platform for advertisers. Okay, no problem there. We get that. But no one's really reporting about the symbiotic relationship there. Then you've got the minor players of the landlords who are making – someone's making money housing refugees in um, apartment units that I have seen the pictures of in my local – uh, magic, we the people, Magic Valley meetings of substandard housing conditions, and we those landlords, someone's making money on that. The other thing that's going on is the subsidization of the refugee wages to the dairy industry. That's another reason why we have the refugees here and why Chobani's here. We are a huge dairy industry, so now you've got subsidized wages, you've got subsidized housing. You've got refugees here that lose their Medicaid benefits six months after they've been here, whether they have a job or not. Refugees coming into my church who have lots of complaints with the CSI Refugee Center of not adequately providing English classes, not properly teaching them how to use, um, how to live in modern America. And you're talking about people who are coming from countries where they don't have running water flushing toilets. Many do not even speak or or don't write their own language and are now required to learn English. Lots of problems, lots of deficits in the refugee center. So you've got all this symbiotic thing going on and you've got the transformation of a rural America. So you also have wages that um, the, let me back up, you also have jobs that if the refugees weren't here, then the local taxpayers, maybe their son or daughter who's still going to high school, looking for a job, they're not going to get that Jobani job or that Cliff Bar job and be able to maintain our, an income and maybe stay here after they're done with college. No, those jobs are going to refugees. So what do you have? You have uh, locals who have to leave our state, city and state because there aren't the jobs for them moving to other parts of the country. So we know a lot of our college-educated um, children who go to the two-year college here don't come back. So a lot of those jobs that are, are Cliff Bar or Giovanni jobs are imported through the visa program too. So this isn't a win-win for our little local community. This is a win-win for the local oligarchy. 
and for the politicians and for the CSI Refugee Center, which, by the way, to this date has not provided a balance sheet showing costs and profit from the CSI Refugee Center, even though that is public information. And if we could find an attorney with courage to file a suit, we could probably find out who is making what. We don't know. So that's what the big picture here. So we get castigated as anti-refugee, but that's really just symptomatic of what's really going on in a big-picture perspective. Well, you mentioned CSI. Just so people know, that means the College of Southern Idaho, which is a local uh, community college, basically, there in Twin Falls, right in the heart of Twin mm-hmm. Falls. And and for people to understand it, I mention that because when people think of a community college or when they think of any any college, you have to understand that it serves multiple purposes in Twin Falls. In other words, it's not just a college. The college is also the center for the, as you mentioned, the refugee center is based there. But also, when you talk about oligarchy, the business center, the, the, the local business center is also based there as well. And so there's a symbiotic relationship. There's a lot going on on that College of Southern Idaho campus. And when you say they should publicly be accounting. I mean, part of the reason you're saying that is because this is not a private institution. This is a public school that has right. been kind of converted into serving multiple municipal purposes. And as I saw personally when I was in uh, Twi- when I was in Twin Falls, the city council, the town council there, is very, very protective of Chobani very protective of Chobani and very critical in particular of your group. When we talk about people being called racist and stuff like that, you've heard that directly from the town council, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The folks that our watchdog group, which is we have teams of of different kinds of teams in we, the people magic Val. we have the media and we have other groups that are doing things with developing legislation that we could talk about. And also the, Twin Falls City Council watchdog group that goes down there faithfully every Monday when they have their public meetings and holds them accountable. And they're the ones that brought this to the CSI or to the uh, College of Southern, excuse me, Twin Falls City Council about this story, and they just flatly denied having knowing anything about it. So, yes, that's what we we do, and that's what that council is about. Yeah. Go ahead. And it's not just support. It's not just support from the city council. Let me, you know, because you mentioned there are people in town who'd love to get a job at Chobani, and this could be part of the reason why. In a lot of ways, Chobani uh, certainly bills themselves as a great employer. Here's a comment about uh, about them. Uh, this is on Twitter. Great move by Chobani. It's, an, it's a newspaper article that says uh, Chobani gives parents leave uh, as issue escalates in U.S. election. This came out a few months ago. And here's a tweet by somebody. Mm-hmm. Great move by Chobani. Every parent deserves access to paid family leave. Now, I mention that because the person who made that tweet is a young woman you may have heard of. Her name is Hillary Clinton. And she, she tweeted that out mm-hmm. while she was running for president of the United States. And so when we talk about these connections that Chobani has, one of them is to Clinton, Inc. One of them is to not just Hillary Clinton, who has tweeted several times about Chobani. But it's also Bill Clinton and the Clinton Global Initiative, where Hamdi Ulukai has been a featured speaker on stage with Bill Clinton for an hour, right? And mm-hmm. Chobani's, Chobani's owner, Hamdi Ulukai, was called into the White House when they were pushing for comprehensive immigration reform. He was personally brought into the White House, was a spokesman with people like Steve Case from AOL. Hamdi Ulukai, who's, again, not a U.S. citizen, was – promoting a change in U.S. policy on immigration. Not just that, but he's also tightly connected with Chuck Schumer, who's about to be the next Senate majority le- uh, minority. Forgive me. I uh, forgive me. I had a nightmare there, Hilbert, for one second that the Democrats were trying. <laughs> forgive me. Just a brief, a brief uh, flash of, of a nightmare. Yeah, take, no, a, he's take about a couple to be of the, deep breaths. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
I, I have to hang on. It's good. You're a therapist, so you'll help me through this. Yeah, this is uh, a therapeutic. But, uh, We're having a therapeutic moment right now on on air. Here we go. That's right. So so Chuck Schumer, who's the Senate Minority Leader, there we go. Senate Minority Leader is also a major ally of Chobani and of Hamdi Ulukaya, and in fact helped Chobani get a major lucrative federal deal where Chobani yogurt, which is now according to a law that Chuck Schumer introduced, Chobani yogurt is now considered a protein and can be part of the school lunch program. And uh, because everyone knows the kids love moldy yogurt. That's the thing. Can't be stressed enough. School children say, you know what? I want yogurt made with mold cultures. They, they, they scream for it. I can't even get, yeah. look, I'm just, I'm just, I can't even get my kids to look at blue cheese. That's literally true. <laughs> and so, so they decided to make Chobani, and that's a big deal. That's a big deal. That's federal money going to Chobani. That was personally ushered through by Chuck Schumer. So I think one of the things that I noticed when I was in Twin Falls is your group, which is uh, – and, and I complimented on you, you guys on it when I was there. I think you guys are a great example – of how local citizens can organize and make a difference. I came into the story, I would consider it late. The assault happened in June. You guys have been talking about the refugee issue for a while. I didn't get into the story until, uh, I want to say September or October, I forget. September? I think it was September. Uh, and, you came uh, in September. Did, weren't you, yeah, weren't you there with, uh, were you there when Richie Gabriel came in August? Or was it I after? was. I came. No, no. I came right before Brigitte Gabriel spoke. I was yeah, like. She came like and spoke the, August fourth. Like okay, so I was there because I was there a long time. So I was. Yeah, you I were. was there a long time. <laughs> yeah, so I was, you were. I was yeah. there, there in August and September, and uh, no, and I really yeah. love Twin Falls and I love the people. But part of the reason I love it is people like Hilbert and the other people I can name them: Vicky and Terry and all the other and Heather and 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 mm-hmm. Tully and her kids. Jesse and everybody else, the people, uh, the people at Twin Falls are great, and you guys have done, in particular, uh, a phenomenal job on a local level of staying organized. As you say, you have people who show up to that city council meeting every single week. They have one every week, yeah. and you have people there yeah. monitoring it. Uh, but I don't think you guys – and tell me if I'm wrong in this – I don't think you guys knew the hurricane – that you were stepping into when you got into this issue. You've got the most powerful people in the world, the Clintons, Chuck Schumer, uh, on the other side of this issue. And I think that that's why the big media has focused on you guys. Does that make sense? In other words, I think there's, there's a pretty clear connection to major power here. Yeah, definitely. And uh, when you look at uh – uh, the Jabani yogurt with his ties to the Clinton initiative, and you know more about the Clinton initiative, it is, the best word I can come up with is globalism. And this is why I had Vicki Davis come and speak to our group, because what is being hailed as being inclusive, being tolerant, multiculturalism, these are just, these are sort of the, the strategies by which the globalists will push this kind of idea, saying that, you know, refugees coming in here to our country, uh, even with the policy as it is, if you were to criticize this, you're not being inclusive, you're being a hater. So the globalism will, will use these buzzwords, giving you a feel like we're all in this together. But what's really going on is, is what you just mentioned, is there's sweetheart deals. There's this symbiotic relationship between international corporations making deals with politicians who are monetizing their positions as public servants and making special deals, that then comes down from on high down into the local level, and our local city council sees money being, uh, being brought into their community through these globalistic efforts. And now you've got Jobani yogurt selling Greek yogurt as a nutritional um, special deal, special thing with them. But what are they doing? They're using refugee labor. The local taxpayers didn't get any sweetheart deals over that. Where's our cut? And we are the one who are paying the spillover costs for the extra health care, 
we're uh, ones um, paying for the Medicaid bill. We get the bill, and the nation and the globalists and the politicians get the benefits. None of this is is presented to us, though, of course, because if you have any criticisms about this and speak about national security concerns, they just then throw labels at you, and if you report it, you're fake news. That's just how this goes. We're talking to Hilbert. No, that's right. We're talking to Hilbert Nelson, who's the leader of We the People Magic Valley in Twin Falls, Idaho. We're talking about the refugee resettlement issue. If you want to get in on the conversation, the number to call, 619 nine two four zero seven eight six. That number again, six one nine nine two four zero seven eight six. Now Hilbert, one of the things you touched on that I think is very interesting is you had you you deal with people who are actual refugees. And I think that interestingly enough, a lot of the media has focused on defending and I'm talking about the big media. New York Times, Washington Post. They focused on basically defending Hamdi Ulukaya. That's the person who they defend. But they don't talk about the impact on the actual refugees themselves. And one of the things I noticed, we talk about those city council meetings. I, I went to about six of them. I did not see a single refugee at any of those meetings. Not one. Mm-hmm. Didn't see a single refugee at any mm-hmm. of those meetings. And I think and, and part also, of the concern. Did you, did you, did, did you see uh, the leader of, of the Advocates for Refugees there either? There is a no, no, never uh, saw pro refugee group, and they they hailed themselves as pro refugees, and I don't think you saw them there either. Mm-hmm. No, I didn't, and and I, I I just point that out because this is not a situation where the refugees. I'll tell you who I did see. I did see some refugees there who were in police uniforms. But those are refugees from about 20 years ago. Does that make sense? In other words, you have you, – you talked about the difference in the refugee program, the way it's changed in the past few years. You've, you've had refugees – this refugee program is about 40 years old in Twin Falls. But the difference was yeah. the, peop, the people who were coming in I, – I, we, we, I think we ate dinner. Uh, I, I've shopped at a shop by a refugee from, I believe, Vietnam. It was an Asian, Asian country. You've got Cambodian or Vietnamese refugees. I don't remember if it was Vietnam mm-hmm. or Cambodia. Uh, but I've, I've been there, and they assimilated in. The problem with the new group of refugees, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there's no even attempt at assimilation, which is why when you go out to the local grocery store, you see people in full burkas, for instance, mm-hmm. um, Mm-hmm. And that's a sign. That's that's not the e pluribus unum, you know, mindset, right? That's not that's not what e pluribus unum is about. E pluribus unum is about you come to this country and we're all Americans. And there were plenty of refugee Americans who I saw in Twin Falls, but none of them were from this recent crop. Does that do you agree with me on that? Yeah. I I see that. Uh, what you're talking about, uh, and I hear complaints about um, not just the dress, but also mannerisms, uh, intimidation. There's a couple of neighborhoods that come to mind where the local residents in that neighborhood with heavy uh, refugee population buying homes are very uncomfortable in their neighborhood now. Um, And I can't go into any more details because it's a developing type of story, something that should be covered um, I've heard many complaints from people who volunteer at the refugee center about the, I'll just put it this way, deficits in the acculturation efforts and meeting the social needs of refugees that are ongoing. I mean, imagine coming from a country where you've not seen a flush toilet. You, there was never a, an economy in your refugee camp. You stood in line for everything. Your house is made of mud and sticks. And you come, you land in Twin Falls, Idaho. That's the extent, and that's not the the overall across the board way, but that is very often what we would see and what I see from refugees coming from Eritrea to my church. And with with all of that going on and then seeing the the gaps in service with the refugee center, so 
and it's not it's not unique to the College of Southern Idaho Refugee Center. So yeah, I see I see that I see um, a concern that the acculturation piece, which is the um, hallmark of multiculturalism and being inclusive and you know having um, this utopia that was supposed to be erupting all over Europe with the refugees, and of course we see the opposite of that. This doesn't seem to be happening very well here. So my concern is what is the Refugee Center not doing for refugees? And right now I think We the People Magic Valley is the only group raising the question about substandard conditions for refugees in these landlord units. And also coming to Jobani, working, and then when they're eligible for full-time benefits are let go. And then a new batch comes in. So I see lots of concerns there regarding that. And our school system has just announced, um, my math is bad, so I'm working off memory, but over 40 languages now coming to the new Twin Falls High School, the impact of that, or on our health care, or other concerns about the tuberculosis that is coming uh, on, on board with the refugees into town. Um, is anyone really concerned about the refugees there about that? And if you bring that up, they just castigate you as being racist. So, well, and let's let's talk about the school system yeah. there because that's something I know a little something about. I, I've been reading a book actually recently. Uh, Tim Ferriss, who's an author who I like, he did the Four Hour Work Week. He's got a new book called Tips for Titans that uh, I'm going through, and it's it's interviews he's done and tips he's picked up from a couple of hundred interviews, and one. One little Mm -hmm. uh, gem that was in there is one of the people he interviewed said he wishes that when people published data, they would have a linked bit of data that kind of contradicts that piece of data. In other words, if you're going to present one side of a story with data, present both sides, then let people make up their minds. And uh, Mm -hmm. I thought that was an interesting suggestion. So let's talk about unemployment and and the schools in Twin Falls. And you'll see where I'm going with this. In Twin Falls, what's constantly touted by the local politicians is, oh my goodness, look how low our unemployment is. And that's true. The unemployment rate in Twin Falls is hovering around 3%, maybe a little less, in fact. And that's a very good number. You have very low unemployment in Twin Falls. Now, the other thing, though, so let's, let's look at it, another bit of data. They use that piece of data to say, oh, look, everything's great with the refugee program. Everything's great with Chobani and Cliff Bar and these other, other businesses. What they don't talk about is this. In Twin Falls, and I confirmed this with the superintendent of schools from Twin Falls, who I interviewed. In Twin Falls, the poverty rate among children – who are in the school system, has risen 5% in about three years. Now, let's take a look at that. So one way to look at how things are going economically in Twin Falls is the unemployment rate. But let's look at something else. The poverty rate among children is rising. And so why is that? Because that's, it, would, it would seem like if things are going, if, if affluence is on the rise in Twin Falls, that that wouldn't be happening. You wouldn't have more poor kids. And by the way, this is an issue everybody should care about because once you reach a certain level of poverty in a public school, everybody in that school gets free school lunches. In other words, normally, the way it works normally is if you're poor, you'll get free or reduced school lunches. But if you're well-to-do, your kids don't get them. That makes sense. But once you reach a certain threshold, uh, I think it's 60%, but it may be 40 I don't. I'm not looking at my nose, so I forget what it is. But once you reach a certain threshold, everybody gets free school lunches. And so now you've got about a half dozen or more schools in Twin Falls where everybody's getting free school lunches. And by the way, who pays the bills? It's not just Idahoans. It's everybody because that's federal government picks up that money. And if it's happening in Twin Falls, it's happening across the country. That's the point I'm making. It's federal money, and it's mm-hmm. happening all over the place. So when, when you see statistics like that, they don't want to, you know, again, this is what the city council does not want to talk about. 
is what's happening with the poverty. So when you talk to the refugees, I'm very curious, what else are they telling you? What's, what are the, what's the voices of the refugees that nobody's talking about in the media? Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what else they're, what else they're doing. Um, I can tell you that um, with the schools here, um, I happen to have information from some of the outlying schools about the numbers of, of poor students coming into the school system, absolutely dependent on the lunch program, and the teachers uh, are overwhelmed with, this is a side issue, but it points to a common core is causing a lot of trouble with the, the students and the increased homework. And these are students who have to go after school and work, they, and they have the increased homework issue going on with that. So we have not only just in Twin Falls proper problems with poverty, but you also have it uh, on the outlining areas. And these are the outlining areas where the dairy industry is located, and that's the dairy industry that Giovanni is needing. I mean, there's no... There's one main reason why Giovanni's here, and that is because we're one of the largest uh, dairy production areas in the country. So, again, that kind of points to that symbiotic place where you have an international, or, uh, international company making a lot of money, and you have um, the politicians um, benefiting as public servants making those deals, but you have the local population who services that company uh, not, not getting the benefits from that. So that's a good point that you made, Lee, about the poverty. Right? I've never heard that here by the Times News. I've never seen that reported. I keep hearing exactly what you said about the unemployment rate, how great it is. And the, I just researched that that's what the uh, Washington Post also focused on, making it sound no, like there's exactly really right. no refugee issue. That, no, that's exactly yeah. right. And the, th- the thing I keep calling for here mm-hmm is let's just present both sides, right? In other words, if, mm-hmm. if the city council wants to make the case that Chobani has brought benefits to Twin Falls, I'm open to that argument. Does that make sense? In other words, uh, mm-hmm. I'm not going to come in and say, no, it's all downsides. There's no possible upside to Chobani being part of, part of the community. There's nothing good about it. I, right. I, I don't take that view. I'm pro-business, no. and uh, I believe that there are some upsides. Mm-hmm. But I also believe that there's some downsides, and I think if you present both sides, mm-hmm. you let people make up their mind, and they go, mm-hmm. on balance, is this good or bad? I don't know. Are there things that we can tweak to make it better for everybody? Maybe there are. But it, this is what's so mm-hmm. disturbing to me about the way – and Twin Falls is a perfect example, but it happens all over mm-hmm. the country. They don't want to – the media does not want to present both sides of the issue. They just want to present – what right. fits their ideological narrative. And, uh, right. So, and that's the thing that I can, we keep running into is that if you have, if you try to present the downside of what's going on with Joe Bonney and Cliff Bars and, and so on, you're suddenly castigated into this label of being anti-refugee, anti, you know, you're being anti-Islam, everything else. And we're saying, no, 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 we're talking about the policy the way you're doing this business, where it's uh, from the UN to the State Department, the Treasury Department, then to, the, then to Butch Otter, and on down to the College of Southern Idaho Refugee Center, we have problems with the system. There, this was never a problem for years. This place has been here for 30-some years. Never a problem. Now it is because of the way you are doing business, and they don't want to talk about that. They just label you, label you, label you, and then they dismiss you. And then, and now you're called a hate speaker, you know, hate speecher. And then, then that's how they then shut you down. And that's my beef with the mainstream media. They don't want to discuss. They just want to castigate. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly my concern. I, you know, my concern, look, and and I will say, and then we'll finish up here because I know you could go on. I really appreciate you taking the time today, Hilmer. But uh, mm-hmm. I, I, this extends to what I will call the local elitists. The mayor, Sean Berger, refused, outright refused to do an interview with me. And I gave him every assurance. I said, we can do it live. We can do it where I'll post the entire interview. As a journalist, I'm, I have no interest in taking 
his words out of context. I have no interest, certainly, in misquoting him or anything like that. So I'm willing to to put it out there, and I'll I'll say it here too. Sean Berger is an open invitation. Anytime he wants to, I'll interview him under any circumstances he wants to, publicly, privately, recorded, anything. He steadfastly refused to do it. Yet I notice in every yeah. one of these hit piece articles, there Sean's quoted every one of them. Every one of them, mm-hmm. he suddenly, he suddenly, and and that to me is just uh, weak. I don't know how else to put it. You know, if you're a politician, you don't only talk to the people you think will agree with your case. Uh, mm-hmm. If if someone's going to give you a fair interview, I think you take the interview. But he's been able to get away with it. But anyway, Hilbert, I look. I really appreciate you taking the time. This is a fascinating story. I'm going to get out there as soon as I can. I think the other thing, we didn't even get right. into it, but I mean, right now, Twin Falls, you've got about three or four inches of snow on the ground, right? <laughs> That's right. Yes, and there's more. And there's more developing here. There's there's a whole other story about what's happened to this family of the five year old. That this is another piece that we. You could do another an, another story on Pamela Geller did that from the Geller report. That's also on our website. We caught we got her news item. Again, for folks who want to look at this story a little bit more in the timeline of everything, all the uh, the Breitbart pieces, everything's on our website at wethepeoplemv.com. You'll see it all there, plus all of the events that we've got planned for the upcoming year, and we've got we're doing strategy meetings on what we're going to do. We're working, continuing to work with Act for America and the John Birch Society. So we, the people, Magic Valley is moving on for 2017. So we'd love to see you, uh, Lee, when you come. You've got to let us know, and you, we'll get together. It's a date. Thanks a lot, Hilbert. Uh, great. Thanks for talking to us again. That's Hilbert Nelson from We, the People, Magic Valley, talking about the Twin Falls refugee crisis.